Okay, thank you everyone for joining. Welcome to the electrification webinar on renewable energy in microgrids. My name is Buko Simboweni. And um, today's um, agenda will look like this. I will be presenting on the model based design for voltaic, uh, voltaic, my photovoltaic microgrids along with my uh, colleague Pranit. And then one for MathWorks will present in the second half of the webinar on enabling uh, green hydrogen supply with uh, MATLAB and Simulink. So as I said, my name is Buko Simboweni. So I'm an electrical engineer at Optinum Solutions working in the digital engineering team. I attended the University of Pretoria where I obtained a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and I'm currently completing my master's degree at the University of Cape Town. My subjects in my undergrad were geared towards electrical systems, embedded design and renewable energy. And my master's focuses on machine learning applications and cybersecurity for physical, I mean, cyber physical systems. Uh, my past experience includes working in LV and MV electrical systems as an EIT at, at ESCOM. Over to you, Pranit. Cool, thanks, Bukosi. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Pranit Kala. I'm a team leader at Optimum Solutions, and I head up the digital engineering focus area. And um, yeah, I look after the whole model based design sections and um, my focus is on the aerospace and defense industry, wireless comms and aviation and automotive. Uh, over to you, Juan. Yes, thank you, Pranit. My name is Juan. I'm a senior engineer in design automation at MathWorks Nordic in Sweden. Um, I've been working uh, for the MathWorks for 10 years with uh, focus on uh, physical modeling and then electrification, the latest in three or four years. Uh, prior to that, I worked at ABB Corporate Research, working with electrical machines and motion control projects. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And then uh, back to you guys. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, Pranit. So a little bit about MathWorks and Optinum Solutions. MathWorks is the leading developer of mathematical computing software for engineers and scientists. Its major products include MATLAB and Simulink. And then Optinum uh, Solutions distributes MathWorks products. And we also have a consulting side where we provide solutions in various industries. Um, today, we'll be looking at simulation based engineering based on models, uh, modeling and simulation of renewable energy systems and and, and microgrids, and then maximum PowerPoint tracking algorithm design, embedded code generation to deploy your algorithms on hardware, and finally, verification and validation. So first, um, I would like to speak about model-based design and how it is beneficial to use this approach when doing your development work, right? So uh, here's a scenario. You are trying to supply power to a portion of the population and you would like the source to be renewable energy. So you perhaps have a solar farm um, and then uh, so an energy storage system and, 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 and a power transmission system. You could use a, a traditional development process to, to, to do this, but there, there are many challenges that you may face using a traditional development process from getting the right specifications, being able to work across you know, different domains and being able to integrate and find errors early in the development process. And, and this is uh, where model-based design can address a lot of these issues, right? So with model-based design, we start off with, with our research and, 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 and our requirements. This is where we have our system architecture, the knowledge of the product that we're developing, um, we then go on to design the model on the Simulink product family. So uh, we'd look at environmental models. So in our case, we'd have look at solar irradiance, our temperature, and then you know we have physical components. This is the plant. Um, we'd have our converters, our battery charging our system, our power distribution system, our loads, and then the the algorithm that actually sits on the embedded system. This is the MPPT algorithms and you know our supervisory logic. Uh, so when we are satisfied uh, with the de with the design model, we can then generate code um, in the in the in implementation stage and deploy to hardware to test our algorithms. Right. So uh, we can generate code, C code, C plus plus code, HDL code, PLC code, depending on the deployment uh, environment. Uh, once we are done, we can then um, deploy to the real world in the integration phase. So it is important um, throughout the entire MPT stages to test and verify our systems, um, to test the behavior against you know, the requirements. This ensures also traceability throughout the entire process. Um, so 
I'll end over to Penny to explain more about, you know, um, the benefits of model based design for power electronic uh, control. Cool, thanks, Kukosi. So once again, I think you guys are familiar with the diagram just shown on the previous slide. Um, this is just to give you a more of a technical perspective of how model based design can be integrated into the system. So more on the project management side and team side. So once again, if you're looking at the top, you bring in measurement data if you have collected that or you're designing a new system where there's requirements that are coming in. Um, once these requirements are in or measured data, you can feed that into the simulation model itself and run all the simulations. So 1,001 simulations or more just to ensure that it's on a computer. And then that will be taken to a real-time testing and implementation phase. So code generation for testing and implementation, like Fukosi has mentioned. You can either be deployed to PLCs or you can, do, you can be doing hardware in the loop testing. You can deploy it to microchips, whatever it is the hardware that you are dealing with for the entire system. And then there's final integration at the end. Once again, on the right-hand side, if you can see the vertical model verification, code verification, and system verification are always done throughout the entire process, just ensuring that the teams collaborate. And um, I just see a question there. Okay, cool. Sorry about that. So yeah, once again, verification and validation, which I will be addressing uh, later towards the end of the presentation. And then if you look at the right-hand side, um, if you look at the light blue blocks, I think these are quite important, like Fukushi mentioned. Um, you are able to model as executable specifications, so multiple people can run tests. Once again, I think quite important from a system engineering perspective, uh, requirements traceability, which is also quite key, um, mm -hmm. tracing all the code throughout the entire process, ensuring that there's continuous and early verification. You know, if most of you guys know or are familiar with the waterfall approach, we want to make sure that we do a lot of the testing early on in the development process so that less time is spent when we are going for time to market. There's automatic code generation once again, and I believe that documented report generation is also quite vital in these cases. You know, documentation is always important. Cool. Um, yeah, back to Bukosi. Thanks, Pranit. So um, these are some of the benefits that you can enjoy when using MATLAB and Simulink for your model-based design hey, approach colleagues. for uh, development. Bukosi? Seems we have a question, yeah. Um, yeah, Mike Barker is, has got a raised hand. Shall so, we? Mike, do you, do you want to ask your question? I believe Mike asked about not being able to see the slides. No, it's in the chat. Um, okay. Can everyone see the slides? Can you see the slides, Adri? Mike, are you able to see the slides now? Or is, is, is there still an issue on your side? Can we help you? Okay, I'm going to assume that everyone can see. Yeah. Sorry, Vukosi. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Um, I hope you get sorted, Mike. So, um, yeah, as I was speaking about the benefits of um, that you can enjoy when you use MATLAB and Simulink in your model based design approach for, for your development work, right? So, we have uh, the aspect of innovation. So, this is where you can explore unique features through, you know, rep rapid design iterations, and then you can conduct cost effective design trade off studies. And then the quality aspect is you can prevent errors from reaching the hardware stage of your development process. And then this also reduces the need to do to rework your, your, your designs. Mm -hmm. And then the cost aspect, you can reduce you know, expensive physical prototypes and then reduce testing costs as well. And then time to market means that get it right the first time and then this accelerates the, the development process. So we can now look at how a simulation-based modeling approach can be used in our grid designs, specifically microgrids um, with, with PV uh, distributed energy resource. So what is a microgrid, right? A microgrid is a group of interconnected loads and distributed energy resources within these clearly defined electrical boundaries that act as a single controllable entity with respect to the grid. A microgrid can connect and disconnect from the main power grid to enable it to operate in both uh, you know, grid connected and islanded mode. So to realize the full potential of microgrids and better understand the risk and benefits associated with this operation, innovative computational tools and uh, system simulation capabilities would be needed, right? Um, so since uh, a microgrid combines uh, distributed energy resources and can also island itself from the utility grid, a microgrid controller or supervisory controller is needed to run all the tasks of a microgrid. It is thus important to test all these control schemes 
um, to test that uh, once it is deployed in the field, everything works as expected. Traditionally, to build a system like a microgrid controller, we'd have to implement these control strategies by um, on a development environment by hand, then come up with you know text, test factors to make sure that all positive possible test scenarios can be tested. We can then deploy onto our industrial control hardware, then we can interface with hardware to test. A disadvantage though of equipment based testing is that it involves what scheduling downtime and the risk of failure because we are testing you know, our new algorithms on actual hardware. So an alternative approach is to replace a lot of this equipment based testing with a digital simulation of the actual grid. This means that we can do as much testing of our control hardware as possible before um, testing with real equipment in the field. Um, so this can all be achieved with Simulink and other Methrex tools. From the models that we have already created, we can use the code generation feature to create code that we can deploy to a real-time target and deploy to real-time you know, hardware such as the speed code. This is what a Simulink model would look like. So Simulink is a block um, diagram based dynamic simulation environment where we can schematically build up simulations like a microgrid with a PV energy resource. Uh, in this particular example, we, we, we have, um, let me get my laser here. So in this particular example, we, we have a microgrid that is connected to the grid. So here we, we can see the utility grid connected here and, and the, there's a block here that, uh, you know, that can generate faults and that. And then we have our feeders represented here and then our distributed energy resource is represented here. And this, in this case is a PV array and then our energy storage system is also represented here. So um, once we are satisfied with this model, we can simply run and observe the system's behavior. And I would like Penny to come in now and just show you how the, the simulation would run. Cool, thanks for Kosi. Just gonna go ahead and share my screen from my side and then we'll revert back to Kosi. Cool, so as Kosi has shown you guys, this is the model that we're dealing with. Um, this is the Simulink interface, so you can drag and drop blocks from the library, move them around, etc. Sorry, Penny, we don't, I, I can't see your screens yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, wait a bit for it to share. Okay. Yeah. Is it showing now? It is. Cool, awesome. Great, so yeah, this is a Simulink environment on the right-hand side of the screen. You can see some dashboard utility features here where you can flip these switches, which I will demonstrate shortly. As of course he mentioned, there's all of these blocks that you can use to model the system. If you go inside the grid system, you can see what, it's look, what it looks like in here. This is the power system, the PV array itself, um, and there's other blocks with all the different settings. So a lot of variety of parameters that you can change to modify the system to your basic needs. There's the DC link inverter control. And over here, you can see an MPPT controller, which is done using a MATLAB function block, um, which of course you will demonstrate later on during the code gen section. So I'm just gonna go out and run the simulation for you guys. It's just a matter of clicking a button and the simulation will compile at the bottom. It gives you updates at the bottom of the screen, compiling library blocks, updating, etc. Yeah. And over to the left, you can see I have uh, three different graphs that are plotting different features. So the top left is the grid loads on the top here. Uh, the right hand side is the battery loads and then there's the cumulative power. So once this thing is loading and running, I'm just going to flip a few switches. So on the left hand side, you see there's an island in control switch. So you guys can see the screen now, the simulation is running. What's great about this is that I can flip the switch and you should see the response quite immediately. So you can look at the power. I flip that back down and have cloud cover. You can see that there's a lot of changes in the cumulative power, et cetera. And then there's these cool dials, which I think are quite awesome. So you can actually supply additional power. So if I spin this dial, you can see that the current actually increases. I can reduce it and you should see immediate changes. And same thing goes with the utility max power set point. So I can move that there and you should see tweaks in the peak shaving algorithm. Cool, so I'm going to go ahead and stop that. And yeah, you can view the graphs, you can save these graphs, so everything is available. Last thing I want to mention is, like of course you mentioned, if you're going to the hardware in the loop simulator, you can see that I've commented out some of the Simulink real-time blocks for hardware in the loop simulations. When you are ready to test, like of course you have mentioned, you can connect these blocks up and you can plug it into your hardware in the loop simulator and hardware and just replace the blocks and click the play button and run the simulation and you're good to go. Cool, thanks for coursing.
Thank you, Penny. It wasn't that great, guys. Um, I'll just go back and share my screen again. So since the slides are starting from scratch. Okay, so then now um, let's look at algorithms that you can design and and deploy using Simulink and other MathWorks products. We'll look at uh, maximum PowerPoint tracking algorithms that control the converters in the PV system. Basically, maximum PowerPoint tracking is an algorithm uh, implemented in the PV converters to continuously adjust the impedance such as the solar array to keep the PV system operating at or close to the peak power point of the PV panel under varying conditions like you know, your solar irradiance, your temperature, the load. So the algorithm controls the voltage and ensures that the system operates at its maximum power point as shown in the graph here. Common MPPT algorithms that you can deploy on Simulink and um, I mean that you can develop on Simulink and, and you know deploy on your smart controller include the perturbation and observation algorithm, the incremental conductance algorithm, and the fractional open circuit voltage algorithm. The PNO algorithm being the most widely used due to its simplicity. The, the algorithm essentially um, perturbs the operating voltage to ensure that maximum uh, power is, is produced. So uh, an implementation of a PNO algorithm in Simulink uh, would look like this, where the MPPT algorithm takes in PV current and voltage values and determines whether to you know, increase the converter output voltage by varying the duty cycle. So the MPPT algorithm block um, actually utilizes a, a MATLAB function block, which will then contain the algorithm code that um, um, and it already showed you a bit there. Once we have developed the algorithms needed for our microgrid controller, we can now we are now ready to you know generate the code and we can then deploy it to a real-time target. With code generation, we can produce code that meet key objectives such as you know quality, cost, performance, time to market, and certification. A MATLAB or simulink, a simulink coder can generate this code quickly. Uh, consistently and in high quality. This means that we can move from a desktop simulation to do hardware in the loop uh, testing and then you know deploy to the field once we are satisfied and um, everything works as expected. Uh, effectively, through model-based design on Simulink, you can simulate um, those designs without the need for real prototyping, and then you can then uh, deploy onto the field once you are satisfied. And so the code generation aspect of it is a key element to, you know, our, our real time testing. So let's look at how you would generate code. Uh, this is an MPPT model that we looked at earlier. So this was part of the model that I need showed. What you would do is you would click on the apps tab um, and then you'd look for the embedded coder app that you will then click on and open up. It seems uh, the video has paused a bit, yeah. Right, so I was mentioning you could like open the apps tab, uh, look for the embedded coder app, uh, open up the app. Um, then you would, you know, uh, change your configuration parameters specific to your model. Um, We're going to be having technical difficulties. <laughs> Bear with us, please. Okay, so here um, you could edit, you know, you change your configura configuration parameters. I would change mine to, you know, a fixed step because I'll be de deploying one embedded hardware. Uh, you can change some more configuration parameters, you know, like your, uh, if you have hardware connected, you can set up your hardware and then, you know, um, 
change some more configuration parameters. Like I will, I'll just keep it at what uh, just code generation for now. Yeah, so you could set up your hardware devices if you have hardware connected. Sorry about the lag, guys. It seems I think Teams is just mm -hmm. slowing down the the video the from video. PowerPoint for some reason. Apologies for that. I don't know if it's for everyone, but on my side, it's clear. The video yeah. fine. OK, so. So the purpose of this is to just demonstrate how um, you could generate your code. So in the end, you would have your if you've generated C code, you have your your C files. So you'd have your example C file dot C file. You'd have your um, your private dot H files, your main dot H file, and you would have also your types dot h files you know your your data files as well so you could then move these to you know your development environment or you could um uh, uh, deploy on on simulink if you if if you wish to so that is the purpose of this video and then i'll hand over to penny to speak up about valid validation and verification cool awesome thanks for hosting cool so over here we have a simple diagram, um, which is on the horizontal. Um, I'm sure you'll see that it's quite similar to the model-based design workflow. Once again, it's just in a horizontal format. So you have the requirements on the left. You have the design and development as the executable specification, uh, as you will recall. And then you would use the integration stage for model use for production code generation. You can then generate the code and deploy it into some hardware. If you look at the top, you can see that there's always the traceability. So I'll talk a bit more about the tools uh, towards the end of my few slides, but you need to do reviews and perform static analysis for C code generation. You need to do equivalence testing, as well as the component and system testing on all the levels. And what's great about this is that if there's traceability set up, which is provided with the MathWorks tools in the model-based design workflow, you are able to trace from left to right, from right to left, and in the middle as well. So that's also quite important when it comes to the code generation aspects, especially when you're doing the static analysis and equivalence testing. So some of the benefits are, uh, let me click closing. Cool. So uh, early verification to find de defects sooner, that's quite important. So if you recall, I mentioned the waterfall approach. So trying to do testing earlier and throughout each process. So as you move along, there are less, deep, there are less bugs and uh, debugging that needs to be done later on. Uh, you can also manage requirements and automate manual verification tasks. And then the workflow also conforms to safety standards, which I'll mention a little bit later. And then there's just a quote that I thought I put from uh, one of the customers from MathWorks. Um, Reduce costs and project risk through early verification, shorten time to market on a certified system, and deliver high quality production code that was first time right, as because he has mentioned. Cool. Another workflow that I'd like to talk about is specific to PLC code generation. So we know that there's two aspects on large distribution grids or micro grids. Uh, there could be PLCs involved. Uh, I won't go into too much detail about the workflow because it is quite similar to the one I showed previously. Now it's just talking about the PLC side of things. So you would generate PLC code uh, after you've done all the requirements testing and modeling, and then you would need to import the PLC, the, the PLC code into a PLC IDE and then deploy that onto the PLC. So similar workflow. There's two streams of hardware that you can test. Both that can be done with hardware in the loop simulations if you have the hardware set up. And once you're satisfied with the C code generated on the controller and the PLC on the PLC side of things, you can deploy to the real world system. And then lastly, I just thought I'd give you an overview of what we cover and what the specific tools do for the verification and validation workflow. If you look at the top, uh, there's requirements. So like I said, it's pretty self-explanatory, uh, you know, author and trace requirements. Then if you look at the next three, so test coverage and check is to measure test completeness, check with compliance, and do all the similar model checks, make sure that you are conforming to the specific standards. And if you look at the fifth and sixth one, it's design, verify, and code inspector. That's for the debugging and testing uh, later on in the stage. And all of these 
can work in the model based team design workflow throughout the process. And lastly, there's the qualification kits. Like I mentioned, certification is quite important, especially for CCO generation. And I know as well that IC and ISO standards are also quite relevant, especially with microgrids, renewable energy. There's lots of those out there. So we do cover quite a wide variety and range of IC and ISO standards within mm -hmm. our MathWorks tool range. Cool. And then lastly, I just thought I'd give a success story. It's always great to see big companies doing great things. And you guys could be one of them uh, working in this field if you're attending the session. So there was a challenge to accelerate control system design. And the solution was to use model based design, like we've discussed with you guys, for the control system. As you can see, the results were quite great, quantifiable process improvements, rapid integration with power system simulation and protection systems implemented in one week. So if you read the blurb there, uh, the quote, it was done quite quickly, eliminated months of hand coding with automatic code generation tools, and they used simulation to enable early design verification. Awesome. awesome. Thank you for neat. All right, that is it from our section. I think Juan, you can step in and then present your section. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks, Kosi. Thanks everyone for listening. Yeah, maybe we can ask if there are any questions from uh, the audience, right? Okay. Uh, while I set up everything. Uh, okay. Okay. Perfect. Uh, we'll be taking questions now. So you could just unmute, unmute yourself or you can post your yeah. questions in the chat. Does anyone need any clarity on any of the slides that you've shared? Um, a little bit more about MBD. If, you, if you'd like, you can post in the chat and we can get back to you. Um, we will be sharing the slides and the presentation and we should be able to put up a recording uh, in about a week's time or so. And yeah, we'll share our email addresses so you can reach out directly if you have specific questions. Cool. Okay, if there are not any questions, so then I may start. Um, Pranit Fukosi, is that okay? Shall I start? Yes, please go ahead, Juan. Thank you. Yeah. All, All right. Time. So, welcome to this section on uh, enabling the green hydrogen supply chain in MATLAB and Simulink. Um, I'm very grateful to the Optinum team who invited me to present uh, this topic today. So, the agenda is going to be um, structure in the following way. So we are going to talk about uh, green hydrogen technology, this, describe that to, to a high level, and then some of the components that we have in there uh, so you to get uh, acquainted with that. And then we will get into the technical scope of the section with particular emphasis on model fidelity for hydrogen production. So embedded development requires a bit higher fidelity, key system performance for let's say, a KPI analysis, medium fidelity, and then techno-economic feasibility where we want uh, agile models, but uh, yeah, consi consistent models, but not to uh, lower fidelity. And then we will have a little section uh, tackling new mobility and um, the end of the cycle for hydrogen. Hydrogen is produced, transferred, and then finally consumed in fuel cells where it's reconverted to electricity. So we will have a few hints on, on the topic of immobility and fuel cells, and then sum up with some follow-up opportunities. So the green hydrogen supply chain, I think if we, if we were to conceptualize this a bit, so it's um, produced um, from renewable energy like wind and sun, uh, electricity and water through electrolysis are converted into hydrogen. Uh, in uh, in electrolyzer units, then the hydrogen gas needs to be uh, stored and then transferred to stations where uh, they will be finally, let's say, uh, used to charge uh, fuels, uh, tanks in vehicles, trucks, buses, or or, or ships. So, um, and then the final step will be, of course, that uh, the hydrogen is reconverted to electricity in, uh, in the fuel cell. So this reproduces a bit uh, one of the webinar series that we have, we are running at the moment. So we have run uh, production and transfer, and then we are about to do consumption on April 26th. So, um, 
So let's get started with electrolysis, water and electricity uh, to provide or generate hydrogen. So uh, when uh, the electricity used to, uh, to generate hydrogen comes from renewable sources, so hydrogen produced is labeled as green. So this is a technology that has many uh, advantages and is attractive because of sustainability, uh, versatility, storability, and, and so on. So everybody agrees on this technology being very promising. However, uh, it is a challenging one to put in place from a technical and also an economic perspective. So uh, high energy consumption is uh, characteristic. Then you have challenges related to managing uh, safely uh, the hydrogen gas and thus the cost as well of all the, uh, all the components and all the intelligence and the engineering uh, power that you need around that. So we at Mathrox uh, believe that the simulation based engineering as in many other cases, will put you on the path to success because it will uh, give you insight and then reduce risk and then just making any investment that you make into this uh, more prone to succeed. Right? From a graphical perspective, so we can see that we have wind uh, uh, that is uh, mechanical energy, makes rotate the, the turbines in a wind generator, and that is mechanical to uh, electrical energy, uh, then uh, a battery unit acting as an energy storage uh, contributes to the uh, production of, of hydrogen by supplying additional electricity or maybe uh, recharging itself with the amount of power is high and then we have met our goals of producing hydrogen. But the electricity and water together in the electrolyzer will produce hydrogen gas. So together, <coughs> with uh, some of the, the highlights that Lucosi and Renit. So we will focus in this presentation on the value of, of multi-domain system simulation with us, our platform Simscape. Uh, so that will hopefully get across the value and the power of simulation to, to get going with embedded development, uh, KPI analysis and technoeconomic feasibility. So one, I think, very, very important thing to, to highlight once again is that Models to be realistic uh, often need to use uh, data that, that is meaningful and uh, that can be available in many public uh, sources online, for example. So have wind, irradiance data, electricity prices, and those can be uh, very nicely imported into MATLAB and then used in Simulink and Simscape models. So by all means, this is uh, a very, very attractive value proposition of MATLAB together in synergy with Simulink and Simscape. So then what you see there is just uh, the profile for one day of wind from Inverness in Scotland. So Mathrox has been investing in this uh, hydrogen technology in the latest year or so, but uh, we have just started. So a proof of that is the, uh, this electrolyzer model that comes in Simscape in, in release 22A. And that is a, a detailed representation capturing the thermodynamic behavior of the electrolysis. So, so this will be suitable for those of you who want to dig deeper into the thermodynamics aspects in, in the electrolyzer, or you want to focus on the electrolyzer as a component to develop automation. Uh, however, we do have another version of the electrolyzer, which is a system level, and that will enable you to do system level simulations uh, in an agile manner. And, and that is basically uh, the one that acts as a, as a load in, in microgrids, and that is the one that uh, I'm going to use uh, in this presentation. But by all means, both are accessible in our 22A release. The, the detailed one with Simscape, I can mention also that the source code for that electrolyzer is available in the, in the shipping example. And uh, so, one one thing that was mentioned by uh, by Vukosi and Pranit was uh, the importance of power electronics in in converting uh, solar energy uh, uh, in capturing the, the the energy of the sun and and then in this case so power electronics are a key element in in converting mechanical energy into hydrogen so basically all the way from the generator down to the electrolyzer so we will have a set of components that we classify as power electronics in a broad sense. We have the generators, those could be DC or AC type, induction, 
or synchronous, many different types of machines are possible. Then DC DC converters, so, so adapting the DC power in terms of voltage and current levels from the electrolyzer and the battery. Uh, both of them will have probably their own DC DC converter. And in the cases where we have um, a three phase generator, of course, the, the rectifier converting AC to DC power because the electrolyzer will always use a DC power. So uh, uh, you can see represented power converters electrical machines and all the control and all the uh, embedded algorithms around that. Going back a bit to the to the uh, topic of fidelity, fidelity is um, a guiding star when it comes to working with model and simulation. So it's often uh, a key decision how, how detailed those models that you're working with need to be in order to be uh, to be useful. So I think you always need to be a bit economic in that sense. So models shouldn't be too uh, unnecessarily complicated because then you lose out a bit the value of simulation, right? But let's say that you are focusing on embedded development at a millisecond or microsecond level for the power converters with a high frequency switching. So then you need some high fidelity in your models in order to accommodate that ambition. Uh, what if you are interested in, in what happens over let's say minutes, seconds, or even hours, you want to see the KPI of an electrolyzer plant, you want to see uh, some may, may, uh, behaviors when it comes to current energy consumption, but you're not interested in what happens in the millisecond or microsecond. So then medium fidelity models are fine for you. They are fast enough and then provide the, the detail that you need. And what if you are interested in evaluating what will happen over months or years, prior to making any decision on going for, for green hydrogen uh, production or investing into that, right? So then you need models that are even more agile. Uh, fidelity will be lower, but then it will provide maybe just the insight that you need. So then you need to, to really uh, find yourself in that scale. What is the level of fidelity that makes sense? So if we start with the uh, high fidelity and better development and component analysis, so let's say that the challenges that we will meet in this stage are going to be often constrained to the physical unit level. So component design, uh, analyzing the component like electrolyzer, uh, safety and thermodynamic behavior become very important because you're zooming into that component. The energy storage, then the battery and the BMS, for example, become even more important when you zoom in into that. Uh, power converters, uh, control of those, fault management, cooling, uh, the generator. Uh, so once again, finite element description might be applicable, uh, electromagnetic design. So you want to submit into those components. And then this in the era of the digitalization, so uh, the digital twin development that we always need to keep in mind. If you wanted to have uh, some uh, prognosis, uh, service or possibilities when it comes to key assets in your electrolyzer plant like a generator or or a converter or even the electrolyzer itself then of course you need to Are there any questions on the chat so far? Um, no questions from the chat so far. Okay, good. Let me know if there is anything. Uh, All so. right. All right. We'll do, we'll do things. So when it comes to energy conversion and high uh, electrical machines, so we have in our Simscape electrical library a set of universal machines, switch reluctance, process, DCT, and SM, that are ready for drag and drop and parametrize. Uh, however, we, we do give the possibility to uh, to have a finite element based machines, maybe from electromagnetic design uh, partner company that is working together with you, and then uh, you want to reuse that design data into Simulink and Simscape. So there's high fidelity plus. Uh, when it comes to the power converters and the DC DC converter in particular, because you're assuming into that component, then uh, you are going to look into the components in there like MOSFETs or diodes with a bit more detail and then 
uh, you might uh, reconstruct your own DCDC converter with discrete components and then maybe parameterize those with data sheet that you have from a, from a supplier like Infineon, for example. So high fidelity for the DCDC converter. For the AC-DC converter, same here. So you have different possibilities when it comes to DC to AC converters. This is a modular one where you can choose from uh, a set of options. But of course, once again, here you could create your own DC-AC converter with discrete components, IGBTs that are uh, complex uh, enough. Uh, so then that possibility is open to you. And then the, the, uh, the advantage of this is, of course, that you're going to capture uh, the behavior of high frequency uh, in the currents and voltages, and that can be interesting in different situations. So when it comes to, to different models, um, I think it's important to emphasize that uh, different levels of fidelity can coexist in the same model, and that is often uh, that you add uh, fidelity or, or detail to the model gradually. So you start with a high level model and then you start to add more detail in the parts where you what you're interested in and then simulate and see what, what the output is. And then if it is enough, maybe you are satisfied with medium fidelity for the electrolyzer, but a bit higher, a bit more fidelity on the converter side. Um, so important to see that it's not black or white. You can sometimes combine high and, and medium fidelity, uh, and that makes a lot of sense for your development. So now a little so hopefully that uh, that runs well. Um, so we have a PM generator, a PMSM permanent magnet machine. So this is a standalone electrolyzer. Uh, so wind uh, generator provides, captures the energy from the wind and then conveys that all the way to the electrolyzer. So uh, our tools will be Simscape Electrical, for example, will allow you to, uh, to do the design and development of the field-oriented control. So there you see the uh, skeleton of that uh, field-oriented control with the outer loop, where we have a speed in and then we have uh, current references out. Then the, the current control uh, block taking in the current references. And then we are going to have and the, uh, the modulation unit, uh, so with different uh, PWM pulse width modulation techniques that you can you can test out and and and, uh, and uh, bring it into the model. Different sampling techniques also as well. So so that of course you are into uh, a, a high level of fidelity when it comes to power electronics, of course. Uh, so then some results that I prove uh, the electrolyzer and generator current so that. Those are making sense. The voltage at the electrolyzer and then the phase voltages that you have, uh, the, the electric power from the wind and the electrolyzer, the DC link voltage during that transient, the energy consumption per kilogram of produced hydrogen, and then and the produced hydrogen estimated for one day. So basically, this puts together the fact that you have a controlled VMSM machine and then production of, of hydrogen all together in the same model. And that allows you to, to test out things like uh, power electronics control, uh, field oriented control, as we could see. So basically, our tools very good to test out with uh, relevant machine control uh, algorithms and then test that all together with the, uh, the electrolyzer unit that is ultimately the goal that you have to produce hydrogen. So I think those lines of Bukosi and Pranit, So I think that simulation can take you very, very far. You can validate a lot uh, by doing desktop simulations in a systematic way. But once again, in the end, your technology will need embedded code to run. So once you 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 gain that confidence and belief, then automatic code generation from from uh, from Matrix will allow you to generate generate code for any. Uh, almost any devices that, that you can think of, C, C++ based being most representative, but also a structured test uh, for, uh, for PLCs, and even uh, HDL code for a field program or gateways in fast devices as well. So automatic code generation in really a broad sense from C all the way to HDL code. 
So now we are going to look into a different uh, variant of uh, uh, hydrogen production with a grid connected uh, electrolyzer plant. And then the challenge here is, is slightly different. I mean, uh, you always need to control the power converter and you have a phase lock loop in order to synchronize with the grid. So that is an important element. And then in this model, so you apply a disturbance of the frequency and then you, you test out how the PLL and the complete system uh, will react to that transient. So then we see what happens when that transient occurs. So there is a, a spike in the currents, but if your controller is doing a good job, so then that should be uh, short and, and, and mitigated in time and amplitude. Uh, so that will be a proof that that your your grid connection is 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 waterproof. Um, another important aspect when you connect equipment to the grid is the effect of harmonics. Right? So, Simscape also gives you the possibility to do uh, harmonic FFT analysis. So then you pick we pick up 15 cycles at two seconds, and then you see the harmonic spectrum uh, that is is shown for 50 hertz, so THD 18.15%. So this can be exported to, to Excel, uh, and then you can, of course, go down to the numerical values of each one of the harmonics. Uh, low load harmonics often being critical, so um, third, fifth, seventh, eleventh, and so on. But the, the frequency is 15.4 in, in real time, so then if you set that up again, and then you see that the uh, the total harmonic distortion then will go down to 8.96, which is really uh, a more realistic representation of what is happening. So, so in grid connected electrolysis, so you can add a, a converter control together with a synchronizing uh, algorithms with the grid, uh, phase lock loop. Then another uh, aspect that we have looked into is the harmonic analysis. Uh, Harmonics often bring a lot of information, intrinsic information on how the electrical machine maybe is degrading. So by being able to analyze uh, harmonics in currents or voltages, you can uh, kind of detect that maybe your generator is starting to, to degrade or there is some anomalous behavior. So then you can maybe together with prognosis algorithms, identify that, uh, that that particular component is will need a replacement or, or that, that some action needs to be taken. So another uh, aspect into a harmonic analysis, of course, energy optimization. So different patterns in terms of uh, modulation can give you a bit better energy uh, optimization and, and less losses. So that is also an important aspect that is linked to harmonic analysis. All right, so uh, so key performance system assessment. Uh, so now we are looking into the, the electrolyzer, not from an embedded development perspective, but we want to look at it as a, as a system, and we are interested in, in system level challenges. So at this point, you, you need to decide what is the best concept that the AC versus DC generation, reconnected versus remote or wind or solar or both, what is the concept that, that makes sense? You don't want to, to, to go into the details, but you want to have a way of identifying AC versus DC, have some hints on which one looks better. And uh, does, are you capable of meeting requirements when it comes to component sizing and integration and modularity or scalability are also important. What if I have electrolyzers that are combined in series or in parallel and, you know, how, how this is going to scale up. So, so those those considerations are, are also important. And then, yeah, last but not least, of course, you need to understand all the energy balances that are happening in that system. Multi-domain considerations, so you have uh, elect electricity, water, thermal behavior, uh, uh, cooling for devices. Uh, so then, then those are very important to, to, to have a very good grip on. To, to, to see that the, the, the concept that you have is going to be go all the way. And from an algorithmic perspective at a high level, so uh, the supervisory logic will, will be the intelligent unit that will decide uh, the, the contribution of the energy storage, when and how much. It, it will maybe make decisions based on 
some uh, indicators, maybe make a decision of using an, an asset a bit less intensely or, uh, or, uh, or so. And then if you have a system where you have a different contributors to the electrolyzer wind and solar, of course you can, uh, you can an energy storage so that, that you want to, to make that selection as well. Where is the energy coming from? And another important aspect is defining uh, relevant set points. So accounting for meteorological conditions, history, and then the, the number of active units that you want to have in your system, right? So when we when we work with uh, with a focus on the system, probably we are going to make some abstraction on the uh, fidelity for the uh, for the machine model. So now we are focusing a bit more on energy flow rather than than the detailed control of those machines, right? So then you have slightly different components in our library that can make your simulation valid but it's still fast enough and, and uh, so that that will apply very nicely here uh, for the converters the same the same consideration applies here so now we are interested in a dc dc converter that uh, converts the energy in the right way so based on a signal from from a, a high level controller but we are not necessarily interested in seeing how the MOSFET or a diode is switching on and off. So then an average value DC DC converter is a lot better because then you can have a, a larger time step in your simulation and then get uh, very good results a lot quicker. So then you make a decision on, on having converters that are functional but not too detailed so that, that you meet your goal, uh, your simulation goal. So. So with this little video, so we go through uh, a DC uh, generator and battery production. So we have for system analysis. So we have that DC generator with mechanical and electrical part. We have the energy storage basically with a battery with dynamic uh, behavior, not very complex battery, but with dynamic charge profile. Then we have our supervisory logic taken in and then set in uh, all those set points for the battery, for the electrolyzers, and then the, the switching. There are two modes for operating this in this particular model. So we have energy versus voltage based. Then we have the DC DC converters, of course, that are in this case regulated with a command of voltage provided by the supervisor logic, and then the multi domain representation of the electrolyzer with a set of parameters as well. So with that, we have everything set up to to simulate uh, very quickly and then see what happens over a rather long period of time. It could be uh, something like several hours very quickly. So then we see currents, voltages, the hydrogen mass produced in kilograms. And then so we we reach 38 kilograms and then the battery goes down to 50 percent in charge. What will happen if we use the energy based instead? So so then we get out to 48 kilograms, but then we have a much higher DC mean current in the generator. So we are using the generator in a more aggressive way. Uh, during that run, the, the battery could recharge itself in a specific points because the algorithm was set to, to, to recharge the battery where, where there was excess power. Um, and then energy consumption per kilogram. Um, so what happens if we reduce the contribution of the battery then? So then we lose out maybe three kilos uh, when it comes to hydrogen production, but then of course the battery will live longer because it has a still 65% charge at the end. So it's just a, a set of engineering trade-offs and then depending on how close you are to meeting your goal, maybe you can be a bit more, uh, uh, save a bit more battery power. So I think this is a sum up for, for one day. So you can see that, um, state of charge, uh, hydrogen mass, generator mean current, some, some key, key performance indicators that will maybe indicate that what are the, uh, the, the advantages and disadvantages of the different approaches and then maybe use that when you're operating that, uh, that electrolyzer plant in the real world. So what is the, uh, the output that you will expect from a, a system assessment model? So system level models. So things like expected hydrogen production and water consumption, so important quantities, 
Then how are different algorithms and uh, strategies performing so con uh, in base, basically different conditions, uh, how intensely you are using the assets and so on. Another important aspect is also um, the energy storage. What is the size that makes sense? And then once you have made a decision on the size, how actively or uh, you want to, to have that energy storage re resource active and when do you need that to be active or when do you need that to be a bit more passive? Uh, I think importantly is that is to keep in mind that all the conclusions from the model will end up affecting or, or be very significant for planning of operations. So you will things like collecting hydrogen, replacing the batteries, maintaining the complete plant will be dependent on on on, on outputs that that the model is now uh, giving. So um, with that, I think we can. Uh, we can close the medium fidelity. Uh, Vukosi, are there any questions on the chat? Uh, no questions so far. Um, All right. Thank you, Juan. Okay, shall I continue or shall we take a break? Uh, I think if you can continue, you can continue. Okay, then, uh, then we can continue and then maybe yeah. end a bit earlier then. So okay. take an economic analysis. So this is where we go one step lower in fidelity. And uh, so basically the, the initial, uh, in this particular analysis, uh, the model is based on uh, photovoltaic energy instead of wind. So that I think gives you a bit more of a, a broad and, and round insight on the capabilities that we have. And then we are in that model using the uh, maximum power point tracking control that Wukosi and Pranit talked about in the first section. So everything comes in nicely together. And once again, here, uh, the value of multi-domain simulation with Simscape, I think, comes very instrumental to, to this uh, techno-economic analysis as well. So um, I think that the basically in that system, so um, it's basically that you're operating with the uh, MPPT control. And then when the sun is not shining, is strong enough, then you decide to 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 get that boost of uh, electricity from the energy storage and the battery, basically. So this is all what is happening. And then let's say the plots uh, just reproduce a bit this uh, the results the, in the model, so just capture that. So uh, so then you can really see, okay, what will happen when when it's night and then you still want to produce hydrogen. To meet your goal for one week, then you need to get that energy from somewhere, and then that that will come from the battery in that case. But uh, of course, that, that there is no uh, no obligation to run the battery, but it depends on how close you are to to meeting your production goal for that week, for example. Right? And then, of course, the, the 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 charge left in the battery, obviously. Um, so, what does techno-economic analysis mean? So, I think it's self-descriptive, but it's basically the analysis of a economic performance of an industrial process product or service. Um, and then I think Mathrox is, I think MATLAB has been used in many different scenarios just to do analysis on financial aspects. But now we are going one step further and we want to link the value of time domain simulation to techno-economic uh, assessment as well. And this is a bit the first step into this direction. So in the industrial world, uh, people talk about quasi-steady um, 8760 simulations. So that is 24 hours per day, 365 days per hour. And that will give you 8760 simulations. So this is a term that maybe will uh, you will you will meet in in, in the future. So I think that we can always start with the uh, uh, the medium fidelity model uh, with the components that we have in our libraries. So I think the network that Rukosi showed uh, is a good example. The one that I had as well is, is a good example. So those are blocks that we have in our libraries and they can drag and drop parameters and get going. But if you want to go one step further and do techno economic analysis, it could be that you need to, uh, to, to condense uh, uh, some of the components into reduced order modeling components. Uh, and that means that you need to use 
obeys the analysis on, on methods like uh, the Thevenin equivalent, where you want to, to represent uh, a bit more complex system in form of a source and in impedance, and that that impedance can be expressed in form of a lookup table. So, by by doing this uh, in this work processing, so then you go from medium fidelity to low fidelity, and then you get those models that are, let's say, have a a, a valid physical behavior, but they are somehow more friendly for computation. So then. That enables technocomonomic analysis in a, in a different scale of time as well. So I think that the, the ability to reduce data, I emphasized that in the first section, but I can do that again. I think it's even more important here that you use uh, as um, realistic data as possible and uh, in some cases just available online, right? So irradiance data, from different regions in the world for one year, so that is quite easy to find. Electricity prices, different scenarios, historical data, quite easy to get as well, and that can be fed into the model nicely to, to do techno-economic analysis. So the model then will, will be have a, a similar structure, but some of the components will have a, an REOM equivalent, reduce of the model equivalent, and that um, that will allow you to 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 perform those technoeconomic analysis simulations of 87 60. Um, so then in this particular setup the electrolyzer model that we have a system level is really doesn't need any reconversion so that is a merit of that electrolyzer system model that is really very very well fitted for even all the levels of uh, fidelity or all the levels of development so so the electrolyzer seems to be a quite uh, quite uh, useful and convenient. But then let's say the problem or that you try to, or the answers that you're looking for is what is the highest and lowest grid cost and the highest and lower solar resources? So basically, if you assume that you are going to pump in some electric power from the grid to meet your goal of hydrogen production, then you want to know when is the, the cost highest, what is when is the, the cost lowest, and then the same for the solar resources. So then maybe that can guide you to have more solar photovoltaic panels or, or find the different strategies when it comes to, to getting power from the grid. Or maybe size the energy storage in a different way, make it, making that a bit bigger. So um, so when you combine reduced order models or HI models and you use sometimes parallel computing in multiple cores in your computer or a, a cluster of computers if, if the computations are really, really very ambitious, then you get agile insights for decision making, and that is, I think, very well fitted with the MathWorks tool chain as well. So, MATLAB, Simulink, Simscape, and and the ability to run in the cloud or or, or parallel computing come uh, very nicely in synergy together. So then the answer is, of course, that uh, you can run 242 years in in 500 seconds. So so that is is quite phenomenal. So, of course, there is a bit of work in setting the model in the proper way, but that is something that we can help you with and be a part of. So, we could see any questions on the chat? Um, no, Juan, we don't have any questions at the moment. No questions. All right. Um, okay, but then, then I think we can uh, proceed with uh, immobility and uh, fuel cells. So, I think this is the the final step in the in the hydrogen production supply chain. Uh, so then basically hydrogen is in a given tank with a given pressure and then you basically need to, to open and regulate a few valves uh, for this hydrogen to get into fuel cells where uh, hydrogen and, and an oxygen all together will uh, deliver electricity that they use in trains, in ships, Trucks, passenger cars is possible, but it's not really economically feasible. Uh, so I think it's more uh, heavy, uh, heavy transportation that will benefit from hydrogen. So when it comes to immobility and, uh, and the consumption of hydrogen, so system level simulation is remains still always a, a very value uh, valuable propositions, and then. You want to have a modeling and simulation platform that is flexible uh, so that you can have more complex 
a bit more agile components whenever it's needed. One of the things that that is obvious when it comes to uh, immobility is that it's going to be certainly a combination of different technologies working together. So we'll have fuel cells combined to batteries, and then those two sources will end up contributing to to uh, to traction of a given truck or a, or a ship, for example. And then, because one important thing will be what is the the right trade-off when it comes to fuel cell and battery. So more fuel cells means that you will need to have uh, more hydrogen on board uh, that will increase the cost but in some cases it might make make sense to have a bit a larger battery and then uh, a smaller fuel cell and that is of course techno-economically related and then going back to what Vukosi and Panit said so of course once you have made that decision of having battery fuel cells with a given uh, with a given configuration then you need to start thinking how am i going to operate this complete system uh, and then you know develop off the all the automation in a, an effective way and then test it as far as as you can with uh, with desktop and virtual prototyping before testing on a real uh, on a real system right and then models that you build up for for a simulation are reusable for hardware in the loop test a little video here showing that immobility e system where you see uh, the fuel cell stack and the battery uh, stack uh, with the cooling. Uh, so then we have a battery component that is dynamic with all those parameters. Uh, a fuel cell where you can uh, also uh, combine uh, several uh, of those in, in series, for example, or in parallel. Uh, DC DC converters also uh, in a similar way to the electrolyzer. And then the load being some servo motors that are consuming a given amount of power based on the torque. And that is uh, a supervisory logic, a state flow taking in information and then processing it for making decisions on how much energy is taken from which source for propulsion, how a uh, battery and, and a fuel cell are, are going to be cooled and, and meet those requirements. So you have two battery modules and three fuel cell stacks. So this is what we get as a result in terms of current charge for the battery. So the fuel cell contributes to maybe 85% of the energy. And that is the, the thermal profile of both elements. But what if you have three battery modules and two fuel cell stacks? So then it looks a slightly different. And then of course, what you're going to see is that the contribution of is let's say 55, 45, so the fuel cell is dominant, but not, not to a great extent. Uh, and then that leads to a different function of hydrogen and so on. So then together with that, you can make decisions on, okay, which, which of the two configurations makes sense from a, a technical perspective, from an economic perspective, and then make that decision, argue, argue for that, and go, go forward to develop the automation. I think that when it comes to automation, you can, you might end up in a situation where you have a hardware controller, a PLC, and then you have a software. So where you might have some people in your organization that are programmers and then have developed C code, for example. So it could be that that the first step is that you build up a physical model and then you want to to validate the software that has been created by uh, by hand uh, against the physical model in the desktop. And that is what we call processor in a loop um, uh, validation, right? So that is something that uh, that you can do. Uh, then, then, of course, you can. Uh, there is one important aspect missing here is that the, the real time aspect. So what you are running here is, is valid from a validation perspective, but you are not capturing things in the re in real time. So when the physical model is then executed real time in a hardware emulator, then we talk about hardware in the loop testing. And then you have the real controller interacting with a hardware emulator in real time. So you are getting as close as you can to the system with, with a low cost and almost no risk. So you can test many different uh, risky scenarios false scenarios without the risk of doing that in a, in a real, uh, let's say, test or prototype setup. Uh, damaging a fuel cell can be 
can be very, very costly. For, uh, or, so then, 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 of course, you end up in a situation where that middle step adds a lot of value. And then once those skill tests have proven successful, then you can say, okay, I want to do the final test on the productized solution or the final system become it before it becomes a product. But then you, you can make the choice of making selective test on the real system because together with heal, then you go, you gain some insight on what type of test makes sense. So we have, of course, testimonials of many companies working with our tools and model based design, but particularly New Vera Fuel Cells presented our MATLAB Expo and then, then one of the of the companies that have dedicated development when it comes to fuel cells and immobility and you know user story video available as well. So together with that, I think I'm going to have a look at, at the at the clock. So conclusion follow-up opportunities. So we could see that the multi-domain physical uh, simulation simscape is able to accommodate different levels of fidelity high, medium, and low, that correspond to different, uh, different, uh, let's say, uh, parts of the development cycle, or let's say, uh, uh, areas in, 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 in R&D. So embedded development and digital twin development, convert to generator control prognosis, need high fidelity, a KPI analysis, that can be done with models that are slightly simplified, component size and energy regulation, energy management. And then finally, uh, models that can help you in making long-term predictions and then asserting commercial feasibility and then even equip you with the ability to calculate return of investment for, for, for a, a pilot plan that you maybe you're thinking. Comes to e-mobility, so um, the electrified propulsion systems are, are going to combine fuel cells and batteries in quite a few cases, heavy transportation, so the ability to do per most performance trade-offs, <coughs> analyze multi-domain interactions is going to be quite, uh, quite important. It is already, and uh, customers of ours are already doing that work, but we have, we expect a lot more work to be done in this area. And then the, 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 the classical principle of model ones used twice. Whatever model you use for desktop, if you make those, <laughs> modifications, you can reuse that model for virtual testing. So the time that you invest in a simulation platform will, will end up paying up also for virtual testing and prototyping. So you can add a real easement without risk and then maybe just reducing the testing on the real, on the final system uh, as much as, as you can. I think this is something that we didn't touch upon today, but there is uh, different, let's say, co uh, methods and capabilities in the math will still change that allow you to do collaborative R&D. So deployment, web applications, functional mockup, interface standard support, the standalone apps. So you can think about sim simulating Simscape and MATLAB as one platform that will allow you to, to work together with different teams, different partners, universities, companies all together. <coughs> and then support all the different tasks, embedded developments, KPI assessment, and techno-economic analysis. So with that said, I think we, we are at the end of our presentation, and then I think we have 12 minutes for questions, if there are any. Um, hey, Juan. Hey, so yes, there's one question. Okay, yeah. Uh, it's in the chat there. So have you explored the LCOE with hydrogen to power? And can that be done in MATLAB? So can, can you say that again? The L... That That's the levelized cost of electricity. So perhaps feeding and this hydrogen to, to engines or... Juan, did you get the question? Yeah, can you repeat the question? I didn't hear. Uh, 
Um, so I'm asking if we've, uh, if it's possible to explore the, so you spoke about the techno-economic assessment, so that would be the uh, level as cost of electricity, not just for, you know, hydrogen production, but then taking it a step further to hydrogen to power. So perhaps feeding that hydrogen to, to like an engine or a gas turbine, can that be done on MATLAB? Yeah, I think that that can be done. But of course, I think what, what I, I like to highlight is that um, you always need to be aware of the goal that you're aiming for and then match uh, the fidelity in your components to, to that goal, right? I think then if you wanted to do that, probably you wouldn't you wouldn't need a very detailed model of, uh, of the gas turbine. So it would be something that will abstract the behavior of the gas turbine in terms of power in, power out, and losses. Uh, but then, then, of course, the thermodynamics into that, that engine will be, will be maybe abstracted in that sense, right? I think we have in our SimScape also the, the capability to analyze and simulate gas. But uh, yeah, it's, I think it, it, it goes down a bit to the details of what is your ambition. But yeah, I mean, techno-economic analysis can be, can be expanded into into that uh, hydrogen to power in a different scenario. Absolutely, absolutely. Are there any other questions from anyone? Um, hope that answered your question, Kiabaka. Uh, yes, thank you. Pleasure. Cool. Does anyone else have any questions, comments? Um, we will share our email addresses uh, if you do want to reach out. Just get more clarity. Um, yeah, happy to keep on chatting. Yeah, yeah. I think that uh, we will make those um, the slides available, and then if if you are interested in any specific model that we we show today, so um, so you are very welcome to reach out, and then uh, we will make that available to you as well. So I I, I assume that models are not all, all of them interested to everybody. So. But then if there is any particular interest that you have in a specific model, so please reach out to me or to, to, to the Optinome team and then we, we will arrange that. Um, yeah, I'd like to, to maybe just uh, make uh, a note on the, uh, the webinar that we have on fuel cell integration for, uh, for a mobility that is coming on April 26th. So that will be online and then you are very welcome to, to attend. We will tackle um, the topic of immobility a bit more in detail and uh, and so um yeah but i think with that i mean if there are not no questions so then maybe we can we can close the session for now yeah can i can i ask a question it's peter from yeah Port Elizabeth. um yeah so we, we're a company that that manufactures uh, pharmaceutical products but in terms of um, I'm sort of energy manager sort of level, looking at power generation, um, obviously the MATLAB um, slides you've shown are quite in depth and in going into the PPT and PPTs and all the integral parts of of that. In, from our level, it would be more uh, overall decision making in terms of how do we mix our generation in the microgrid. Um, okay. You know, we, and, and then. Uh, the other question is how, how does MATLAB deal with the actual the real life losses of you know um, you, you know you put a model in for MPPT for instance but you know it doesn't it, it, how do you know which one I'm going to purchase or which which type of generator I'm going to purchase and what losses it will have or efficiencies is that is that all in a separate sort of block so I'm sorry I'm coming in quite cold here and and haven't extensively mm -hmm. used MATLAB. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, but uh, I think that um, yeah, maybe I will start with the second question. So uh, the components that Wukosi and and uh, and I showed you. So some of, for example, the converters and the and the generators have um, some losses inbuilt in them, right? Uh, but however, I think that that you need to have a deeper look into into uh, how these are accounted for, and that is documented in the blocks. And then based on that, you can make a decision, okay, this block seems to be uh, 
good enough for my purpose. So maybe you need to create your own component. That could be with a Simulink or Simscape language. You can create also your own component if that is is needed, right? I think in the um, in the same for converters. So you have uh, sometimes losses that are tabulated. So based on uh, on DC voltage level and then the current. So then you have a a matrix ca capturing the losses. So um, so the losses are somewhat uh, simulated in those models, but how how detailed those losses are, then you need to have a, a deeper look into. Um, I mean, some other components like um, pumps, compressors, so they, they, then the efficiency is a bit more tabulated directly, right? So you have matrices that are coming for mechanical and and um, and this type of uh, efficiency, for example, right? So I think that you have that in building the blocks, but um, if that is important, of course, you, you, you should explore that a bit closer, right? Um, but yeah, I think that one of the advantage of MATLAB and Simulink is that it's, it's a very, very flexible platform. So you can build up a physical model with with same scape of components, but you can also build one with with a set of uh, MATLAB functions representing different parts in your process. So, so you don't, don't feel constrained to use Simscape for, for, for everything. I mean, in some cases, it might make sense to have a set of uh, MATLAB functions just to, to capture the energy flow in a good way, if that is the goal that you're pursuing, right? Peter, um, does that answer the question? All good? Yeah, and just to add on, you know, Peter, we 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 can also just you know provide uh, support just to kind of uh, understand what kind of uh, problem in depth that you're dealing with, and um, that's what we we do here at Optimum and with the support of Network. So we're always available to 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 further you know uh, explore your, your your problem. Yeah, I think in your case maybe you're pharmaceutical, so maybe. And the, the electrical power comes in, and then what is important to use? What happens maybe from that when that electrical power comes in, right? And maybe what happens on the grid side is is a bit secondary. So that could be the case, right? But I mean, you are very welcome to to reach Optimum and then Matrox, of course, to to work together. Or maybe what will be the possible and, and best for your case? Yeah. Awesome. Any other questions? All right. from uh, Any comments, feedback of sorts? How many of you are familiar with uh, with uh, Simulink? Yes, the majority. Cool. Um, I mean, hopefully the, the, the section was at the informative level, not too complex, but I think maybe technical uh, savvy enough so, so that, and that yeah. it, it caught your attention. But, uh, yeah. And we can, I mean, the, we, we've covered quite a bit, like uh, Juan said on a high level, the, if there's certain aspects or components that you know aren't specific to electrical so maybe you in a different team or your teammates might be working on firmware or plcs or you know system engineering aspects um you know that's that's all available so it wasn't the focus to discuss specific sections it was very focused on the hydrogen uh, green energy and renewables uh, high level systems but they there are things that stem from that, as you would all be aware, you know, pro projects are large, you know, there's, there's different teams, different components, different aspects. So uh, we're happy to help answer questions of those regards as well. If you're going to go in depth on yeah. specific components, uh, you know, looking at requirements or, you know, just uh, working in teams together, how do you do integration, et cetera. Uh, all of those aspects, I mean, feel free to ask us as well. Um, we can also advise. Yeah, but maybe we have a couple of minutes now. May I ask? Can you write in the chat what would be your favorite topic for a for a next seminar, for example? So if you can, yes, please. Let us know what what is. That would be really cool. But 
yeah. in any case. I mean, <clears throat> right. and thank you everyone for attending. Um, I think the session was quite informative. Yeah. We'll be looking forward to hearing back from you if maybe you have some further questions. Mm -hmm. All right, it was a pleasure. Thank you all and have an excellent day. Oh, thanks, Thank everyone. Thanks, Mr. Everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Juan. Bye bye. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.